Thanks to all of you for coming this evening. My name is Ivan Semenek. I'm the science correspondent for the Globe and Mail. Uh, and that means I get to spend a lot of time picking up the phone, talking to researchers all around the country, all around the world, asking them all the kinds of questions that uh, strike my mind. Now I'm going to get to do it in front of you. So, uh, and, uh, and I hope this will stimulate some uh, thinking and some questions on, on your part as well. Uh, thanks also to the Canadian Museum of Nature for, for launching this series. It's meant to be a series that takes us to the cutting edge of science, but not just the cutting edge, to particular places in the life sciences where things are changing swiftly. Uh, and, uh, and those swift changes uh, are in turn making possible some provocative choices on our part. So we're going to be talking about that, we're, we're going to be thinking about some of those cutting edge ideas and hopefully, uh, you know, as, as we uh, break out in more informally this evening, this will, this will propel our conversation still further. So guiding us through this series will be some of the many experts that work here at the Canadian Museum of Nature, that work with the collection, that pursue the museum's uh, specialties in areas such as Arctic research or, or species species discovery. And actually species discovery is very appropriate for, uh, uh, for tonight's topic. In fact, it's maybe more species recovery uh, than discovery. And, uh, and to, to bring us into this topic, we have uh, Jordan Mallon. So I want, to, first of all, to introduce and to welcome Jordan Mallon this evening. Excellent. So thank you very much. So, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and lots of reason to, uh, to give him a, a big hand. Uh, he uh, comes from uh, the Ottawa area originally. He grew up fascinated by paleontology, part of that interest stimulated by this very museum. It eventually led him to, uh, to do a PhD in paleontology at the University of Calgary and then brought him back now to, uh, to be a postdoctoral fellow here at the museum where he specializes in in uh, paleo evolution, uh, paleo paleoecology. I'm sorry, and the evolution of dinosaurs, uh, and of course that also brings to mind uh, a, a, a almost unavoidable part of this conversation. So I think we should just get it on the table right now. We're talking about de-extinction, and uh, not every topic in science comes with its own movie, but but this one does. And and you really, I think we're going to have to deal with it, Jordan, at the beginning. Uh, and I could sum it up in two words, Jurassic Park. Is that what we're talking about when we talk yeah. about de-extinction? Uh, good question. Uh, you'll notice we don't have any dinosaurs displayed here, or at least we don't have any non-avian dinosaurs displayed here. So when we're talking about uh, de-extinction, uh, the idea of cloning these extinct dinosaurs, uh, non-avian dinosaurs, I should specify, are, are, is off the table. Um, and, the, and why is that? Why, so why is that just because it's too hard or is there some more, uh, is there a more solid barrier that is forever going to keep that out of reach? There's a more solid barrier. Uh, that bar barrier being we just don't have dinosaur DNA available to us anymore. Uh, there's been talk recently about finding maybe, you know, soft tissue structures or proteins still preserved. But really when you're talking de-extinction, you're talking about recovering um, useful DNA, viable DNA, and we just don't have that in any way, shape, or form for dinosaurs. So when we're talking de-extinction, we're probably talking about animals that have died maybe in the last 10,000 years, thereabouts. Okay, so dinosaurs off the table, but uh, the last 10,000 years still leaves a lot of territory and a lot of animals that have since, you know, gone by the wayside that potentially could be coming back. So how Realistic is this? How close are we to this possibility? Yeah, we're. W it depends. <laughs> it's a tricky, uh, tricky question with a tricky answer because it depends on the animals you're speaking about. The farther you go back in time, the more difficult it will be to resurrect an extinct species. And again, it goes back to DNA breaking down over time. The farther back you go, the less DNA you'll have to work with. But to answer your question more directly, we're actually already there. We've actually already, if I can use the word, de-extincted, coin a new verb tonight, uh, we've, we've already de-extincted a species. Uh, actually, that happened 11 years ago, and a lot of people wow. I don't think know about that. 11 years, I, I, yeah, <laughs> so what, what species is it? I'm sure, it I, I'm sure if we asked anyone in the room, I don't think that many people would, would know. No, it surprised me to learn even. It's, uh, it's called the Bucardo, or the uh, uh -huh. Pyrenean Ibex 
which is basically sort of a, a long-horned goat that lived in the, in the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of uh, Spain and France. And um, the species went extinct in the year 2000. Uh, the last individual named, named Celia uh, went extinct. She died, a tree fell on her, unfortunately. But, but she was being closely monitored. Um, and before she, before she died, scientists had managed to take some, some um, tissue from her and freeze it at, uh, in the frozen zoo. So they had, Diego. before the tree fell, before literally, <laughs> they already had some of her DNA on ice. That's right, yes. Okay. And, uh, and after she died, the species was officially declared extinct. And in 2003, those same scientists that collected um, those tissue samples uh, made an effort to clone her, to resurrect uh, Celia specifically, and they did it successfully, mm -hmm. um, more or less. Um, they brought her back, they used a, a goat uh, as a surrogate, um, out came the new baby, it was birthed. Uh, I hope that there's not another tree involved in this. No, not yet, no. <laughs> but uh, that, that newborn, that uh, newborn Bucardo was the first example of a de-extinction. And unfortunately it only lived, I think it was seven minutes or something like that. It, it died of a uh, lung defect, hmm. which apparently is pretty common um, in these uh, cases, these cloning uh, because cases. Because the cloning process. Yeah. So, you uh, know. Now, would they attempt that again or was it just a proof of concept? There's talk about trying it again, money being a big issue, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a limiting factor in this case. But yeah, the uh, Bucardo has the designation of, of not only being the first species to be uh, de-extincted, but also the first to go extinct twice, <laughs> which is <laughs> awkward to think about. So, you know, and, and actually this, re you know, it's a funny switch from how we started with Jurassic Park because here you're talking about an extinction that happened in 2000 and they already had the DNA in hand. So in a way, what you're talking about here is maybe we could call it, you know, preemptive uh, de-extinction where, and, and it, it calls to mind, you know, should, should we or do researchers, conservation groups have DNA for other species precisely for this purpose. Yes, uh, the frozen bank I mentioned to you earlier is at uh, the zoo in uh, San Diego. And it's, it was made, uh, I can't remember when it was established, but it was many years ago now, dozens of years ago, I think. Um, and uh, it was established for that purpose, to retain frozen tissue samples of all kinds of mainly endangered species uh, in the hopes that it might one day become useful. And, and in this case, it, it did. We were able to, to resurrect a species. And there are many more uh, tissues waiting in, in that frozen zoo to be um, brought back to life again one day. Including other extinct species, or? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think, when you're talking about extinct species, certainly, you know, species maybe as far back as the turn of the last century mm. they didn't they didn't have the foresight then to usually retain frozen tissue samples so if you're if you're talking about frozen tissue you're usually talking maybe in the last 20 or 30 years right. beyond that you're going back to museum collections and trying to get samples out of uh, mounts like uh, like the one we've got on display here the passenger pigeon right now of course if we ask the question, why is this happening now? I mean, in a sense, you've, you've told us it really has to do with this revolution that we're all living through in, in genetic technology. But that can also be very hand wavy. You know, you could kind of give us the impression, oh, you know, you get the DNA and, you know, there you go. That's all it takes. Is it really that simple or, or can you give us a better sense of what the limitations are on the science? Yeah, it's, it's not simple at all. Um, cloning is becoming more and more common. Of course, there was Dolly the sheep back in the 90s. Um, uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a process called uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer. And the way that works, it's, it, it's pretty common now, is um, you will take the nucleus, which contains most of the DNA in the cell, uh, out of an organism cell, let's say in this case uh, the uh, the Bucardo, and you will place that nucleus into the egg cell of a surrogate, which itself has been uh, denucleated. The, the, the nucleus has been removed. So you're basically reprogramming that egg cell with a new set of DNA, a new set of of genetic instructions, and 
you give that cell a bit of a shock and if you're lucky that cell will start dividing the way an embryo would develop and in the end yeah you, you, you get a new or a de-extinct species in this case or, or not extinct you can do it on, on living animals too but there are other methods of, of de-extinction cloning being just one of them uh, another one that's being talked about right now is uh, backbreeding or, or artificial selection. So selecting for traits in living animals uh, to develop something that looks like an extinct animal. Huh. Um, and the third alternative is uh, genome editing, whereby you're going into the, the genome, the strands of DNA, the chromosomes of an already living species and tweaking them to look uh, like that of an extinct species. So, uh, so interesting op options there, and I, you could start to see the technical challenges involved. I want to ask you to, to kind of give us some of the likely candidates for this, but before we get there, you know, this does raise a question. You know, I often have reported about astronomy in space, and one thing always comes up, uh, you know, people sometimes make a comment where, you know, why are we sending people into space? Don't we have enough problems here on Earth? Why do we have to do that? And there's a kind of parallel point to be made here because it seems like a lot of effort. Of course, it's exciting to think about using this new technology in this avant-garde way. But meanwhile, we have hundreds of species, if not thousands, that are facing extinction or that are threatened in, in different, and certainly biodiversity is threatened, you know, if to, to sort of give that parallel argument, shouldn't we be worrying about them that are still here with us as opposed to trying to revive species that have been long gone? And, um, y you know, is there a risk that by having this kind of conversation, we're taking the eye off the ball? Uh, of, of what really is important as far as conservation goes. Yeah, that's a major concern when it comes to de-extinction, this idea that, you know, if, if, we, if we can de-extinct species, people will stop caring about keeping species around that we have now. They'll stop caring about uh, to conservation efforts um, because the, the mindset will be, ah, let them go extinct, we'll just bring them we'll back again. We'll just start again. them up again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are actually some, some pretty good arguments for de-extinction that I think make the issue, you know, a little less one-sided. Um, actually, Hank Greeley, who's a professor at, uh, at Stanford University, at the law school there, um, came up with a list. And uh, he, he mentions uh, five sort of de-extinction pros, uh, one of them being um, uh, scientific advancement. So we're going to learn a lot about what made these ex species extinct, um, a lot about genetic engineering and the process of doing that. Um, the, second, uh, the second argument would relate to uh, technological advancements, be it implantation or maybe we'll learn how to um, create chromosomes from scratch, something we haven't been able to do yet. Uh, another argument for relates to the environment, which I think is a really key one. Um, a lot of these extinct species um, played the role of, of a keystone species in their environment. Mm -hmm. So what is a keystone species? It's a species that basically facilitates biodiversity around it. It, it alters its environment in such a way that, um, uh, that enhances the biodiversity around it. Um, so if we think of, let's say, the mammoth, for example. The mammoth was a keystone species. It maintained a habitat called the mammoth steppe, which is effectively an arctic grassland, mm -hmm. which which really we don't see anywhere on Earth today, um, maybe in patches here and there. And the argument is if we bring back the mammoth, we maybe can bring back this mammoth step that, that uh, evolved with it and, and, and have all the bio biodiversity that went with it. Now see, that I, I wouldn't have guessed that necessarily because I, I would have thought, well, here's this species with an environment that no longer exists. So, you know, how could we, it's, it's like saying, you know, if we brought back Louis Armstrong that somehow, you know, New Orleans would recreate, you know, as it was around <laughs> him or, or something. So uh, how would the mammoth bring back uh, a, whole, a whole ecosystem? Yeah, well, as I say right now, the mammoth steppe is available still in small patches here and there, mainly in Beringia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's actually an initiative there right now called Pleistocene Park. 
and the idea is if <laughs> there's an e there's an echo here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Just don't take the tour before they <laughs> work out. Don't get things. out of the car. Yeah, don't get out of the car. <laughs> and the idea they they've basically got some some fenced in land right now, and the idea is to introduce some mega herbivores that are endemic to the area, and hopefully one day a mammoth too, or or a few and to slowly transform that enclosed area back to this uh, step-like environment and then gradually, gradually sort of expand the fences and to incorporate or encompass a larger environment and to eventually to, to remove those fences and to let these, uh, you know, these mega herbivores to go out and, and repopulate the land there once wow. again. Well, I have to admit the idea of seeing a mammoth, a woolly mammoth, is a very exciting prospect. I find that exciting. It's a, and, and I can see, I mean, it's not the same thing looking at the, at the genome and actually looking at the animal. And I can imagine that there are things that we could learn, just like looking at sheet music is not the same as hearing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. But, you know, we've got other artifacts here. Before, uh, before we finish, I, I definitely would love to have you take us on a tour of <laughs> this you know, this potential zoo that could come back. Yeah, so here at the Canadian Museum of Nature, we've got uh, some neat uh, examples of species that might one day be de-extincted and, and they sort of run the gamut in age. So I'll introduce the back one here first. This is uh, the passenger pigeon. It uh, went extinct in 1914. The last uh, individual died in uh, the zoo in Cincinnati. And uh, this actually used to be um, among the most numerous uh, um, or most abundant rather uh, species of birds in the world. Um, uh, specifically it, uh, it was common in North America and uh, any single flock of these animals would number in the billions apparently. They, they're described as having darkened the skies almost like an eclipse and you know they're extinct now. All we've got left are these, these neat old museum displays We've also got uh, the moa, which was a large flightless bird um, that lived in Australia and the surroundings. Um, it's been extinct since about the, the 1400s thereabouts. Um, and as far as I know, there are no major de-extinction efforts on, on this bird. Um, but it's certainly, uh, there, there's lots of material kicking around. It's certainly, I think, a, a candidate anyways. Wow. Um, We've got, uh, this is a mammoth molar here. This is not a turtle, this is just the tooth. Just the tooth, yeah, that's right. They didn't have many teeth in their, in their jaws at once. They, they were, only had enough room for one or two. That seems a bit scary to me. But, but that, yeah, yeah, that's just the one tooth. Just the one tooth. Uh, of course, the, the real thing was, was many, many tons. And, uh, and how know, about this one down here? This also looks pretty This good. is a neat one. Um, this is stellar sea cow. This is the skull of, uh, if, if you've, heard of manatees or know anything about manatees or dugongs. This was uh, very closely related to those guys, uh, except this weighed upwards of 10 tons as opposed to half a ton or, or a ton. These were big animals. Uh, they went extinct in 1768 uh, and they lived in, uh, in the Northern Pacific. So, you, you know, this is an amazing array of creatures and, uh, and some of them quite, I mean, they're in historic times. It's fascinating to imagine what it would be like if if they were to come back. Are there risks, though, to the environment? I mean, in a sense, uh, I mean, maybe it's one thing to imagine some grassland in Siberia somewhere, but like the passenger pigeon, that, they were around here. So if they were to come back, would that not upset the order of things today? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, there, there are risks involved, and it's hard to comment on those risks because we've we don't know a lot about these animals. Some, some we, we do know something about the passenger pigeon. There are still people alive today who would have seen the passenger pigeon. Um, but for some of these animals, we know next to nothing about them, uh, except for what maybe we find in the fossil record. And who knows which diseases they might have carried. Some of these could potentially be uh, disease vectors. Think of uh, you know, the mosquito and the West Nile virus. Uh, or well, cane toads in, in uh, Australia, yeah. you know, could this be the next cane toad? They, you know, could, be, they could become an invasive right. species. So most of the efforts to date 
have focused on invasive species from before time. I mean, it's really <laughs> <laughs> now uh, you know. So so clearly, there's a technological possibility here, and you've given us a sense of why people might want to do this. Some of the tantalizing possibilities. Should it be regulated, though? I mean, who? I, I mean, can anyone just go out and start doing this, or should there be some kind of international framework for deciding yeah. whether this is done? I think most people agree it should be regulated. Um, the problem being right now is that things like the Endangered Species Act don't make mention of the extincted species. So we don't yet know how to handle them. Um, they may fall under, uh, you know, once we do de-extinct these things, they, may, they might fall under the, the scope of being an endangered species. Let's say if you've only got one example. Um, but there are all kinds of interesting questions, you know, politically related or, or laws. One being, you know, if you, if you genetically engineer one of these species using genome editing, um, the question then becomes, well, who owns that genome? There might be patent laws involved as well, um, because you could argue that this species has been man-made. Man uh, therefore, the company mm. that designed it, you know, might have an argument for patenting the species as right. well. And I guess the other question is, this is kind of a moral question, which is, I mean, we, we, we sort of live in a, in, with the concept, I, I think a fairly commonly shared concept, that, that extinction is a bad thing, that we feel bad when, when creatures disappear from the earth. So if we can reverse that, is it not our moral obligation, not just to think about it, but by all means go forth and do it because if, if the opposite is bad, is this, by definition, isn't this good? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it boils down to that, that I'd like to hear what the question. Pope has to say about that one. <laughs> I, I, think it, I, I really think all this discussion boils down to the moral question. Do we, do we have an obligation to these extinct species to, to bring them back? Some people would argue uh, yes, um, very strongly, in fact. And other people would argue no, you know. To, why do we owe something to something that doesn't exist anymore? How do, how do we owe, uh, you know, it, it seems like a nebulous concept. It's interesting. Now, I think probably many of us have ideas, and I can imagine this spinning off into all sorts of political domains. What about in the research community? Is, it a divis is, it, is this a divisive question in, in, among researchers? Um, I think it depends on the researchers uh, and, and where you are, certainly. You know, and if I think of uh, Mike Archer, who's at uh, uh, New South Wales University in, in, uh, in Australia, certainly uh, he's got a number of backers down there in Australia looking to resurrect things like uh, the thylacine, uh, the gastric brooding frog. But there are a number of other researchers who would argue, as you have earlier, that we really should, and I think we find them mostly in the, in the conservation ecology community, that we should really be focusing our researchers or rather our resources on keeping those species that are endangered now rather than trying to bring back these, these extinct species and introduce more endangered animals to the world. Well, it's, it's really amazing where this has brought us because basically we're left with, this is either something that we really, really should do or maybe we really, really, really shouldn't. I'm not gonna ask you your opinion because a part of the idea is we want people to think about this. So I think what we're gonna do now is bring to an end this part of the conversation, but I think for us, hopefully it'll just be the beginning of the conversation. But for now, I would definitely like to thank Jordan Mallon for walking us through this fascinating topic. And, uh, and the Canadian Museum of Nature, and thank you very much.